Welcome to Boulder. It's a great day to zoom in between ski runs here today. We had six inches of snow last night. It's a perfect bluebird out there today. Uh, whether you're zooming in from Summit County, Washington, D.C., points in between, thank you for joining. My name is Brad Bernthal. I am an associate professor here at Colorado Law School. I am the interim executive director of our Silicon Flatiron Center. And on behalf of Colorado Law and our team here at Silicon Flatirons, we are very glad to have you joining today's fireside chat. Uh, a special thank you to our supporters at Silicon Flatirons who helped make this possible. Uh, here's how we will proceed. We'll start with a 30 minute discussion between FCC Chairwoman Rosenworcel and Attorney General Weiser followed by a 45 minute panel discussion that will, will respond to the fireside chat led by my colleague, Blake Reed, all in about 75 minutes. Check the Zoom chat window, please, for more details, including profiles of our featured speakers. Closed captioning is available. To view it, select the closed caption button, mark CC in the bottom of your Zoom window. Three quick notes to share before I turn things over to Phil. First, we acknowledge that wherever you're joining from, Silicon Flatirons is here in Boulder on the lands of First Nations peoples. Second, I wanna highlight two terrific events that Silicon Flatirons has coming up. This coming Monday, February 21st, we've got an Entrepreneurs Unplugged session, really great story of solid power, a battery technology that came out of the CU labs and recently went out public as a company. And looking ahead to March 28th, Jeff Kosef will be discussing his book, The United States of Anonymous. Finally, number three, bathrooms are just down the hall if you need to use them. I look forward to that statement being relevant to you in the not too far future. Trust that we'll see you here in Boulder. Terrific to have you here, Attorney General and Chairwoman Rosenworcel. Phil, over to you. Thank you, Brad. Thanks for your leadership of Southern Flatirons. It means a lot. Uh, Brad and Travis Littman are two of the extraordinary students who have engaged with and uh, benefited from the program. Travis, for those who don't know, is now the chief of staff to our FCC chairwoman, Jessica Rosenworcel, who is here today and is one of the most qualified people to ever be in that position. It is worth noting that the Arca Silicon Flatiron started 22 years ago in a conference that was focused on telecommunications law for the 21st century. Well, we're in the 21st century and I wanna take this fireside chat and really get the benefit of a uh, incredible mind. Um, we're fortunate, uh, Jessica, to have your leadership at the FCC. Uh, I wanna start with a earlier policy making episode, which for people who are cynical about how ideas can matter, you um, and I in different places were involved in a important effort around spectrum to solve for a problem that was a problem because we had so much spectrum in the hands of broadcasters, there was this huge growth for wireless broadband. The challenge was how could you enable spectrum to be moved given that you had to actually get an act of Congress to do it? Well, thankfully you were there to help make that happen. Maybe if you could just start by saying a few words about that important and uh, really a transformative effort and, and what you took from that experience. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here. It would be even better if I could be in Colorado and seeing this um, six inches of snow in person. I assure you, uh, we got nothing like that in Washington right now. But uh, in any event, um, it's really great to see you here in your, um, in your role as the Attorney General. And I can say I knew you back when, because part of telling the story of how we got to know one another really is about the 4G revolution and spectrum policy. It was becoming apparent to all of us that we were gonna need more space in our skies for wireless mobile use. We were no longer just making calls. We were using the internet in our palms with our new smartphones and the app economy was taking hold on our shores. And we needed to make sure that we had the airwaves to support it. That was probably, um, really sort of early days, but I think insightful ones because both in the White House and on Capitol Hill, there was a recognition that it was time to start doing some creative things with spectrum policy. And to really understand that, now, now I'm getting all professorial and going back, but this feels like the right setting. You really have to go back 
and look at the history of how we used to allocate our airwaves. We used to have this command and control policy at the Federal Communications Commission where I work, where we would set up a slice of the airwaves and say, this is for broadcasting. We'd set up another slice and say, this is for radio. Something else is for satellite. And we didn't really suggest to any of those entities that they could be creative with that spectrum. We just told them what it was for. And in 1994, Congress decided maybe the FCC shouldn't be in this command and control business. And maybe instead of just handing out licenses you know, to the people we liked best for the services we thought were best in those airwaves, we should st embrace auctions. There were a whole lot of uh, legal analysts and economists that contributed to this, but the idea that we would sell off the licenses to the highest bidder. And when we started doing that in 1994, it became lucrative, but we also wound up getting the early days of the wireless revolution and the phones that we all now rely on. And so by the time you and I were working on it, we were really looking to jump to the next generation of that technology. And we also had a jump in creativity. Like what would we do with those auctions? Instead of just auctioning off airwaves that had totally been cleared, could we be a little more creative? And with the help of folks like you who are working at the National Economic Council, we took a look at the broadcast spectrum that in that command and control fashion, we had set aside decades ago and realized we had really over allocated for TV stations. In other words, we had more spectrum than we had television stations that were viable. So there was this idea that, well, what if we instead repacked them and then took those excess spaces and made those available for new wireless broadband use. This spectrum's really good. You don't have to be an engineer to understand this. It's low band. And just like a TV signal propagates far, you put this spectrum in a phone, you put up a tower, you're gonna get a signal really far away. It's really valuable when it comes to serving everyone. And so we came up with a proposal where we induced some of the television stations to get out of the business by paying them for it, repackaged their stations into smaller slices of our airwaves, and then took that excess and auctioned it off to our wireless carriers. This was probably the most creative spectrum auction we ever came up with. And I really think of it as the fuel that made the 4G wireless revolution happen. Uh, the details are kind of wonkish, but I can absolutely say that you Phil Weiser, Colorado Attorney General, was there. You were there at the beginning. You were there at the start. You were part of the brain trust that made it happen. Well, you brought it through working on Capitol Hill and the FCC. And what's remarkable, having had that experience, you now are at another critical moment on broadband. And this is something that I was able to work with some state AGs, bipartisan support for. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Act is going to put a ton of money into addressing this broadband challenge. The FCC's role here is obviously crucial to help us as a nation meet it. Talk a little about your leadership now on, on broadband and how to take advantage of another transformative opportunity. Yeah, it is really transformative. I mean, there was a time before this pandemic um, where you'd have to tell people in Washington about broadband and they'd think it was nice to have, but not need to have. I think it's become apparent to all of us. It's now an essential service. We need it in every household, everywhere. And when you look for historical analogs, really the best one is the 1930s and the Rural Electrification Act. Because in the 30s, you know, the cities, we could turn on the lights, but we just assumed that that electricity was never gonna make it to the farm, that refrigeration would never be available on the farm. It was just too costly to serve those rural areas. But we mapped where our electrical lines were, we figured out where they weren't, and we built uh, cooperatives and funding streams to make sure we got electricity everywhere. And now when I think of the $65 billion that's in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, I see exactly the same thing happening. We're gonna map where service is and is not, and we're gonna to try to fill in every single gap. And I think if we do that, we are going to bring more economic prowess to more parts of this country by bringing them online and making digital opportunities more broadly available. You have done a... Uh great policy innovation at the commission with the idea of a broadband sort of nutrition box, for lack of a better <laughs> metaphor, letting people know what type of broadband they're getting so people can make informed decisions. Talk a little bit about that work as well. Yeah, um, look, you go to the grocery store, you can pull a box of cereal off the shelf and you can learn 
what carbohydrates and calories it has in it. You can pull another box and you can compare it because there's that nutrition panel that's black and white, super distinctive. And you know what it does? It allows us to be good consumers. It allows uh, competition to thrive. And the idea behind what we're doing at the FCC is when you buy broadband, it should be that simple too. The service is complicated. Every plan you get when you sign up for wireless, when you bring broadband into your home. Look, I, I do this professionally. There's a lot of fine print. We're sitting here in front of a lot of people who are in law school. It's not easy to read. It's not easy to parse. So can we make it simpler? So let's borrow from that cereal. Let's borrow from what we see in our grocery stores and literally develop a broadband nutrition label so you can compare one service to another. And we'll have standard listing there with data, you know, speeds, introductory rates, all the things that you're going to need to know so you can make an apples to apples comparison because part of competition is figuring out how we get the infrastructure out there, how we make sure companies can thrive and compete, but it's also about making sure consumers can make informed choices. And so last month we started a proceeding at the FCC to require broadband nutrition labels at the point of sale every time you sign up for service. And really we are absolutely copying them off what you see in the grocery store. We want it to be that simple and iconic. And the goal and our intention is, is to make those mandatory uh, by the time we reach the one year anniversary of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which is in November of this year. Well, I'm excited. It's a great idea and appreciate your leadership on it. One of the other elements I would underscore is as a state attorney general, when companies make that commitment, if they violate it, I can enforce the Consumer Protection Act, which says you can't deceive consumers. So by creating this requirement of disclosure, if they don't disclose effectively, appropriately, um, they can be liable for it. So it's a great enabler. Um, companies are gonna have to think long and hard about what they say they're doing. That's a terrific point. I look forward to more coordination. Well, so let's talk about coordination state AGs and not every federal uh, official who leads a regulatory agency thinks about state AGs the way you do. And one area I'm excited to work with you on is robocalls, which <laughs> when I became state AG, we looked at what our number one complaint was the year before robocalls, the number one complaint. I'll have you to know, we're getting ready to look at this because we have March as Consumer Protection Month. Robocalls are not relatively as bad as they were. They're still terrible. A reason that we're in a better place is we did get a federal law passed called the Trace Act, and we're working to address robocalls. Um, you taking a leading role have said, let's work with state AGs and I and some other state AGs will help do a memorandum of understanding that we can do so that you can work more effectively with state AGs. Let me first ask the, the why question, then we'll get to the how. Why do you come at this thinking, hey, how do I work with state AGs? Not every federal official does that. So let's just start here. Robocalls are incredibly annoying. I mean, they are destroying trust in our networks. You sit down, you wanna have a quiet dinner and there's someone on the phone trying to sell you something you didn't ask for, you don't want, you don't need. We should be able to put a stop to this. Now, scam artists are creative. I don't have to explain that to someone who works on consumer protection, but it feels to me like we have to figure out every single resource we have to stop them. And I've got some at the FCC that relate to networks, but I also know that if you add up my authority with your authority, my subpoena power with your subpoena power, and we start locking arms and sharing data, we are far more likely to find those bad actors and hold them to account. I know at the FCC, and within the last year, we did work with the Ohio Attorney General on, uh, we had the highest ever fine for, under the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, for some incorrect information that an auto dialer was sending out about voting over mail. And then we also worked with the Missouri and Texas Attorney General over the last few years because we found that there was a scam artist that made more than a billion calls with fake health insurance products. And when I look back on both of those two efforts, they were among our most successful enforcement activities. What they had in common was we worked with attorney generals from the state. And that's why setting up a memorandum of understanding with you and Colorado is so important and that you know, you're know you gonna use your authority to bring your friends and colleagues from the uh, AG ranks in. And I know that you've done some work already with Vermont and North Carolina and Tennessee. And uh, we've got 51 because we count the District of uh, Columbia state AGs. 
I would like there to be a world where every single one of them agrees to share information, because if we uh, bulk up our resources and work together, we're going to find these bad actors and hold them to account. Well, one of the challenges we have, which your leadership and your history underscores, is bipartisan collaboration. It is the norm in the state AG world. We talked about that in Spectrum, talked about that in broadband, talked about in robocalls. Um, before I get to a couple questions from students, which is a rarefied Silicon Flatirons tradition. You have now been at the helm, uh, initially as an interim, now as the confirmed chair of the Federal Communications Commission for uh, basically about a year, a little over that. Uh, what are some of your reflections on your first year of leading of this agency? Um, first of all, it's a, it's a crazy privilege. I think this is the most exciting sector of the economy. It's where innovation is happening and the choices we make have such extraordinary consequences for everyone in their home and their business for our civic and commercial life. So even when it's exhausting, and many days it is, it's actually a treat. I'm also really proud that in an agency where right now we have two Democrats and two Republicans, we're getting a lot done. And in the last year, we held our third largest spectrum auction in history with critical mid-band spectrum in the 3.45 gigahertz band. I set up the nation's largest ever broadband affordability program. We've never had one that uh, offers discounts to low-income households to help them get online. Now we do. Not only now do we have a program. This week with the vice president, I was able to announce that we have 10 million households signed up in less than a year. That's pretty extraordinary. We, we've got about a quarter of the population that we believe needs assistance to get online signed up already. And I think more good stuff is to come as we're partnering with every kind of organization you can think of to help get the word out from AARP to the NFL. If, uh, if there's an organization out there that wants to start talking to us about how they can get the people who listen to them and love them signed up for broadband, we're going to be able to help them. Um, other things we've done is we are renewed our focus on network security. I think that this has fallen by the wayside at the FCC and the truth is anyone who works in communications needs to make it a priority. We have set up fundings to systems to uh, remove insecure network equipment from our nation's wireless uh, carriers. We have also decided to double down on innovation and have started exploring open radio access networks, which takes the, um, you know, the kind of opportunities we're now seeing in cloud functionality and starts moving them into networks as they grow more virtualized. And it's really a treat to try to figure out how to push the future so it comes at us faster. Uh, at the same time, we've done some work uh, funding uh, telehealth projects during the pandemic. I'm just really proud of those because I think they've had meaningful impact. And when it comes to um, consumers, we also put in place 988, which is a three digit code for suicide prevention. And I'm really pr proud that we were able to make it not just a call line, but a text line as well. And I could keep on going on, but I'm gonna end with one more, which is that for years, I've been railing not just about the digital divide, but what I called the homework gap. The kids who went to school who had internet access, but then went home and didn't have it and they couldn't do their nightly schoolwork. By the one count, there's between 16 and 17 million of them in this country. And uh, during uh, the last year, we were able to work with Congress to get a $7 billion fund to help with the homework gap. And to date, the FCC has helped with devices and connections with more than 12 million students. That's a very big deal. We focused on that close in the pandemic. Thank you for that leadership. As I noted, we have a great tradition, goes back to the beginning of giving students the first questions. We don't have a lot of time with the chairwoman, but we're thrilled to have a chance to hear from a couple of students. Brad, who's the first student who asked the question? Stacy will bat lead off and Rachel is on deck, Phil. All right, Stacy. We'd love your question. Hi, thank you so much for sharing your time today. This is amazing. Um, I really loved hearing you talk about student connectivity, rural broadband. Um, I'd love to hear, do you see expanding the role of schools and libraries at all? Um, whether that's connecting E-rate into the infrastructure bill or some other creative solution so that schools and libraries can provide more connectivity for communities? That's a terrific question. And um, I, I wanna point out something here. This is one of the areas where Congress was radically ahead of its time. I know it's not trendy to point those things out, but back in 1996, and um, I'm sure some of these students were not even alive then, 1996, 
when uh, if you wanted to talk about the internet, you're probably talking about the information superhighway. Congress passed a law that set up the E-rate program, which helps fund schools and libraries with high-speed internet access. And I think this program has been a quiet powerhouse because pretty much all the schools in our country have really high-speed broadband, so do our libraries. I'd like us to do more work, by the way, with libraries on tribal lands, but I think we are at a place where that program has done incredible good. But we should start asking what you just described, what can we do to bring it to the next level? Because we know that those community institutions are so valuable, but also as an economic model, if we have really high speed service present there, we make it incrementally less expensive to deploy it to the surrounding areas. So I think that model back from 1996 is still valid. We just have to keep on reinventing it so that it continues to thrive. Well, we look forward to that reinvention. We will hear from Blake Reed, who leads our technology policy law clinic, which I know will be developing new ideas and maybe proposals before the commission they've been able to do over the years. Uh, Rachel, I think you're the next student question asker. I am, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of times I think about my very basic internet setup as a student that's still $50 a month. And I wonder um, how are the, at the federal level and the state level, how are we encouraging competition to occur for those internet providers that are often total monopolies at this point? And also, do you guys see a timeline for kind of weaning off the subsidizing model and on to um, a more encouraged competitive environment? It's a great question. And I'm gonna be able to point to something that we just did this week at the FCC I'm really proud of. One third of the people in this country live in multi-tenant environments, which is a kind of legalistic term for apartment buildings and the like. One third of us, that's a lot. Um, I bet you a lot of students know what it's like to live in an apartment building. And it turns out in a lot of those apartment buildings, the landlords and building owners set up sweetheart deals with one broadband provider. So you move into that building and you don't have choice. Now that's kind of perverse because if you think about it, these are the densest living environments we have in this country. They're the ones that are most hospitable to competition and the infrastructure that produces, produces it. And so with my colleagues this week, we came out with much, much clearer rules preventing those kind of sweetheart deals. And what does that mean? It means that they're not gonna be able to set up exclusives with just one provider because we think that apartment buildings and condominium complexes and public housing are places where competition is most likely to thrive. And as you suggest, that's what lowers prices, increases innovation. I think in the interim, we're gonna to continue to have our uh, broadband subsidy program for low income households. But I think over the long haul, we want to make sure we have more competition because that's the market force that helps us lower prices. I'd also add the point about getting more spectrum out there. It's going to be interesting to see whether and when we have robust enough wireless broadband alternatives <laughs> via uh, the spectrum that can actually give people some other options through the wire <laughs> connection. So something to watch. I have to ask because there's so many students here. Knowing what you know now with the benefit of a really successful career, what advice would you give to our students as they think about their journeys? Oh, wow. Um, first of all, I know you have wonderful students because as you mentioned, Travis Lipman, your former student is my chief of staff and is um, not just a dynamo and a lovely person, but a first class intellect too. So I benefit immensely from that and I have for years. And um, He's also a native of Boulder itself. So, uh, you know, Boulder produces good ones. Uh, what advice? Um, I'll probably get in trouble for this, but I think you should ask for permission less. I think the number of people have told me to like, you know, well, you should check with them before you do X. You should make sure you get clearance before you do Y. You know, have you socialized that idea before you do Z? I have to say that I think that um, asking permission a little bit less is uh, a useful way to look at the world because there's no shortage of people who tell you, no, you're not ready, it's not your turn. And I think it's valuable to sometimes remind yourself that if you're asking everyone for permission, you're unlikely to make progress. Um, so that's my advice, though I have to tell you, I'm not sure I'm gonna pass it on to my children just yet because <laughs> I want them in the business of continuing to ask me, but I think by the time you're in law school, I think it's useful to know. 
So uh, Blake, we're gonna do the handoff and give you a chance to ask a question for the two of us before you take the panel and pick up these and other themes. Well, well, thanks, Phil, and and thanks very much, uh, Chairwoman Rosenworcel, for for your time today. I think you can guess um, the question that I will ask you, um, riffing on the theme that Phil started of um, a, of a legacy that uh, that that really is part of your early career and is something that you've built on for a long time, um, which is the accessibility of communication services networks and and so forth. Um, and I think it's under under told your role in drafting um, the twenty first century. Communications and Video Accessibility Act, the uh, sort of digital update to the ADA. I wonder if you could talk for just a moment about the commission's vision um, for as we move forward on all of the initiatives that you've talked about today, um, both in broadband deployment and consumer protection and other areas, um, what role you see accessibility for people with disabilities playing? Absolutely. So the Americans with Disabilities Act, I think was passed in 1990. And it was in 2010, 2011, 2012 that I worked on the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act. And it was an update to that law. It was an early effort to acknowledge that technology was changing and we needed to make sure that people with disabilities were not left behind. And that this was um, a market where historically, if you didn't take action, they could be left um, pleading for access. And this was a law to try to make us think about access as products were being developed and rolled out to market. I actually think it was a terrific civil rights law. Um, I'll never forget I was there when the president signed it as someone who had worked on it. And it was really exciting because I, it had my boss at the time, Senator Jay Rockefeller and Stevie Wonder. And I got to acknowledge to you, I never thought I'd see the two of them standing on a, you know, one is a, like a fan of Baroque music and the other one is this iconic American, you know, American star. And they both stood on either side of the president as this was signed. And um, Jen, definitely one of the highlights of my career. But uh, it's amazing what that law did. And it's amazing now in 2022 that I look at that law and I think it needs an update. That's how fast technology is changing. And it's really a challenge for people who draft legislation, write policy, to figure out how to put the, that, um, the vocabulary of access in terms that are neutral enough that stand the test of time. And I think there are many ways that law did it, but I think there are some, and this pandemic has demonstrated it, where it did not. And in fact, what I've been thinking about lately is when every document comes to me that involves that law now, I turn it back to my team and I say, can we ask questions about the pandemic and communications during the pandemic? Now that we've normalized these video conferences, what does it mean? How does it fit into the scheme of the law? Do we need another law? Do we need to revisit some fundamentals of what we already have on the books? I really think that this pandemic, it's an inflection point for so much in our lives, but I think we need to make it an inflection point to ask about digital age access for those with disabilities in this country. And so I hope that I can use my time at the FCC to do that. And I know Blake, you're gonna help us as we navigate those legal shoals. Uh, and uh, very, very grateful for that, Chairwoman, and, and also grateful uh, for my student attorneys who will no doubt be joining us uh, in that work. Um, Brad, I hand it back to you for, uh, for, for our transition to the panel. Yeah, um, I'm gonna introduce Blake here momentarily, but before I do so, I wanna give a warm thank you uh, to the Chairwoman and the Attorney General. Really terrific to have this conversation today. Many thank yous for doing it and come see us in person before too long here in Boulder, please. Can't, can't wait. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank, Bye. thank you. So much, uh, we're gonna bring back Blake Reed. Uh, Blake is a clinical professor, a colleague of mine here at Colorado Law School in Silicon Flatirons. He leads our Samuelson Glushko Technology Law and Policy Clinic. Uh, Blake is going to be spearheading this panel. Blake, over to you. Brad, thanks so much. And gosh, what a rich uh, tapestry of issues um, for us to, to talk through. And, and we are blessed with the, uh, the, the benefit of having 45 minutes to get through uh, the, the, full, the full range of telecom issues. Good um, luck, but, panel. Good luck. <laughs> uh, happy to say that I've got an all-star uh, panel of folks uh, to help me do that. Um, so I'm going to turn to them. We're, we're going to get right into it. Um, order of operations. 
questions. We'll spend about two minutes, uh, a person just doing some opening reactions and then try to spin into some of the themes um, of, of the conversation um, for the next 25 or so. And then of course, we'll go back uh, to students and to the audience for some closing questions and have been seeing some questions come through in the chat already. Um, please keep them coming. So I'm gonna go in order, uh, Ernesto, Gus, Jennifer, and, and Nile, and I'll introduce everyone in turn. So let me start with Ernesto Falcone, who is the Senior Legislative Counsel um, for the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, has got a primary focus on broadband access and competition policy, among other things, and leads EFF's work uh, on that space. Ernesto, obviously a lot about broadband uh, in this conversation, a lot of issues right in your uh, strike zone. Uh, turn it over to you for a couple minutes for your reactions. Yeah, certainly. I, I think um, what I really value on kind of the, the framing that uh, the chairwoman uh, pointed out was there's so much history to where we are to lead to where we are now. And and even the, a lot of, of, of per personalities, uh, you know, herself included, particularly when she was a staffer. I remember uh, being a staffer when she was a staffer uh, on the House site. And I remember one of the first first uh, telecom issues I had to handle was the DT, DTV uh, transition. So um it's it, it i felt like that was still yesterday but i guess it is it's, it's starting to approach ancient history in some respects um you know clearly i think the um the challenges are vast in in a pandemic and now approaching an endemic post-pandemic world on uh when it comes to what, what broadband means for people and i think uh the the mountain of work fa facing that that the chairwoman and the fcc is um you know enormous uh because the the needs are are are, are not uh, dwindling, they're, they're rising. And I think uh, I thought was particularly um, uh, interesting and, um, you know, I think uh, great to hear is, you know, the emphasis of on schools and thinking through kind of the next, the next iteration of E-rate and other uh, programs that were designed around facilitating access and with, a, with the right mindset of um, the essential nature of the service. That's a, a fantastic place to start, and we'll we'll definitely come back um, as we get started. I think we'll start off with uh, with broadband uh, deployment and the pandemic as as kind of our first our overarching issue. But before we do that, I'm happy to turn it over to my colleague in uh, 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 not quite uh, rectangular state uh, to the to the east, um, Gus Hurwitz, who's the professor of law and Menard director of the Nebraska Governance and Technology Center. Um, he is. Uh, a scholar in law, technology, and economics, considers the, law, the interface between law and technology and the role of regulation in high-tech industries. Um, Gus, over to you for your reactions from, from an academic and, and, and other perspective. Uh, yeah, so uh, first, uh, uh, it's great to be part of this discussion. And uh, amazingly, with the pandemic, uh, Blake, I don't remember the last time you and I have had a chance to speak. And actually, that's my uh, first thing I want to uh, say about uh, the chairwoman's discussion. Um, this is the first event I've been at where uh, she has officially been the chairwoman, and that was wonderful to see. So I, I want to start by uh, recognizing uh, 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 that. Um, the two comments that I think that I would have. Um, first, uh, the current FCC, and also to, uh, uh, there might be some disagreement about this, but I think a pretty substantial extent, uh, the uh, last couple of years of the previous FCC were wonderfully boring. Um, and I want to emphasize wonderfully, um, the, the sort of stuff that uh, the, the chairwoman was talking about, a lot of it is high profile and very important stuff, certainly uh, um, uh, rural broadband funding, that's obviously going to be important. Uh, the multi-tenant uh, environment uh, uh, action that affects a lot of people, but ORANs, cyber, uh, a robocall cybersecurity issues. This gets into the nitty gritty technical stuff that doesn't make headlines, but is really incredibly important. Um, I, I uh, did a podcast a couple uh, uh, weeks ago, I guess at the in December, um, with uh, uh, Harold Feld. And uh, one of the things that uh, came out of that podcast, I haven't done this yet, but I really want to get uh, a bunch of hats made that say, make the FCC boring again. 
Um, and I, I think that we're succeeding at that. And it's good for all of us. It's good for the country. It's good for those of us in these discussions. Um, it's good for policy. So uh, I, I think that that is the current status quo and uh, I applaud it. Um, and where we have, I see there are a bunch of questions uh, coming in about this, where we have really controversial issues right now with the FCC, it's the FAA's fault. Um, so uh, we, we can turn to that in uh, questions. Uh, the, the last thing that I'd like to uh, just observe, I, I can't not uh, comment on this. Um, the chairwoman's closing advice, don't ask permission. Uh, obviously, uh, Blake, you and I are frequently on opposite sides of uh, uh, regulatory debates uh, and the like. Um, I, I agree 100%. Don't ask permission. Um, and that goes to such a important aspect of uh, the, the challenge of uh, regulation and technology and the role of government. Um, permissionless innovation uh, was uh, so important to the internet. And I, I don't want to uh, oversell its goodness. Um, certainly, uh, uh, per permissionless innovation has given rise to a lot of problematic technologies and implementations of technologies. Um, but finding that that right balancing point between getting not not requiring permission, but having enough oversight that those who don't ask permission don't go uh, uh, off the ranch and do problematic things. That is such a fundamental challenge for those uh, in the regulatory and innovative sphere. So I, I think that there, there was a subtle, but I think really important uh, uh, element to uh, that bit of advice from the chairwoman. Uh, Gus, I, I'm compelled to note that in the chat, uh, my colleague Margo Kaminsky said precautionary principle for the win. So take that as a, as a counterpoint. All right, lots to get into here. But before uh, we do that, um, please to turn to Jennifer Tatel, who is a partner at Wilkinson Barker Nauer uh, LLP, where she represents clients in the communications and information technology industries and has served in a variety of roles in public service, including as the, the acting general counsel um, of the FC. Um, Jennifer, I uh, urge you to decline Gus's invitation to make this boring, uh, but over to you for your uh, opening reactions. Thanks so much, Blake, and thank you for the opportunity to join you all today. Um, what I took away from the, from the fireside chat um, was what I thought was sort of an interesting theme of um, creativity and the need to think about the issues that we're facing in the communications and information technology sector in a new and different way. And I thought it sort of permeated all the different areas that she touched on as a substantive matter. Um, looking back, for example, on the incentive auction um, and what a success that was. Um, and it was really a very new and different way that we, at least in the United States, had been thinking about how one could clear spectrum and we're faced still, um, or again, perhaps, with looking for new and creative ways to facilitate spectrum sharing and spectrum clearing. And then all throughout the other themes that she talked about, you know, we, the, the uh, agency and Congress has done a lot in the area of robocalls. Maybe one could say that, that they have addressed a lot of the low hanging fruit. And we need to think about more creative ways to make sure that the efforts that um, are ongoing in the robocall space are um, creatively geared at getting to the bad actors, not to the entities that are trying to actually do the right thing. Um, and then also, you know, the CBAA, um, you know, a, a much needed update to the ADA when it was when it was adopted. And as the chairwoman suggested, perhaps we need another update again because we're looking at a post-pandemic completely different way in which we primarily communicate and we have to think creatively about how to ensure um, accessibility for all in the sort of modern communications landscape. So, um, you know, maybe what we do might be thought of as boring by some, but there is a, a tremendous call, I think, for creative thinking into how, how to address these issues going forward. 
Fantastic, Jennifer. And on the topic of creative thinking, um, I'm happy to invite into the, the conversation um, someone who I, I, Neela, I think this is your, your first time at Silicon Flatiron. So, so welcome. This is the flagship event of the Silicon Flatirons uh, network or, or however you like to say it. Um, Neela is the editor in chief of The Verge. He's a, a contributor to CNBC, uh, hosts the excellent Decoder podcast and The Verge cast with Dieter Bone. Um, and Neela, I have to know from your biography, your official biography says that when you were four years old, you drove a Chrysler into a small pond because you're trying to learn how the gear shift works. So if don't ask for permission. See, there you go. There's a lot. Per- so, so we've got permissionless innovation. So Neela, you covered these issues from the perspective of trying to make them make sense to consumers, make them make sense to users. Um, what are your, uh, your high level takeaways before, before we dive into the meat of it? Sure, uh, I'm pretty sure Blake invited me here to be the comic relief. So I agree with everything everyone said that was positive. We had the pleasure of interviewing the chairwoman many times. I think she is unusually direct for a politician and like, tries to do things, which is good. But the two things that jumped out at me were one, her pride in a 2-2 FCC uh, getting stuff done, which I think she's rightfully proud of, but it's a 2-2 FCC. And she has been stymied by absolute gridlock over that last slot, which would let her agenda go forward, or a lot of the Biden agenda go forward, and a lot of the things she wants to get done, get done. So I think the pride is correct, but I think it's Hard to talk about the FCC as it is currently constituted without noting that it is mired in gridlock in Congress. The second is ORAN, uh, which is a personal uh, obsession of mine. Uh, very few people, I think this group might be it. Like, we might be the people interested in ORAN. Um, ORAN is fascinating because the entire T Mobile and Sprint deal is predicated on the creation of a fourth wireless network by Dish Network, which, by the way, is a satellite company. I have no idea what they're doing. And their technology bet is ORAN. So to hear the chairwoman say, we're just figuring this out now, when we made a gigantic deal, we allowed a gigantic deal to go forward on the premise that we would create a fourth wireless carrier. And we still don't have the regulatory frameworks or even the technology that necessarily works for such a carrier to exist. I think from a consumer perspective is, oh man, we just reduced a bunch of competition in this country. And we have no idea when this fourth carrier will show up and do all the things we're talking about. Like if you wanna bet that wireless networks are gonna provide competition in low competition broadband environments, you need more wireless networks. You need more competition in wireless to get rid of things like broadband counts and like. So those are the two things that jumped out at me, right? Is one, you've got an FCC that's doing a bunch of stuff. It is delightfully boring. It's not doing all the things they wanna do. And second, we are still making some pretty big technology bets to create competition that are not necessarily anywhere close to payoff. Okay, Neil, I, I'm going to take your invitation since we're since you're diving into Spectrum. I'm going to switch our order up a little bit here and and start with Spectrum issues because I feel like once we get into uh, broadband deployment, we're going to get uh, a sidetrack talking about net neutrality or something, and then <laughs> then our time will will be over. Um, so so let's jump into some of the themes that I heard you all tease out um, in the context of Spectrum policy. So I, I've heard the role of urgency with the pandemic, the need to have more more robust networks, the need uh, to, to, to be able to, for, for consumers to be able to do more. Um, the role of history, obviously, Ernesto, you talked about um, the, the long backdrop of some of these. And, and I think we heard the, the AG um, and Chairman Rosenworcel talk about how some of these ideas really go back the better part of, uh, of 30 years. Um, Gus, you and, and Jennifer both brought up, I think, uh, two related concepts, the role of regulation and the role of innovation, um, which I think cut through some of our spectrum debates. And then I think we're going to have to engage this issue of bipartisanship. Um, Gus, I, you, you started by, by saying that the FCC has been, uh, as a result of uh, uh, its current bipartisan status, been working on wonderfully boring issues. And Neil, you described that as, as gridlock. So I think there's something um, to work out there. But I, I think spectrum is maybe, the, maybe a good place for us to, to ease into these questions. 
questions. Um, so so uh, the three things I want to tag in Spectrum. Um, number one, uh, the Spectrum auctions, uh, the, and the particularly the broadcast incentive auctions, the, the idea uh, of, of refarming Spectrum from an old allocation to a new allocation. Two, I've seen a bunch of talk in the chat about FAV, FCC, uh, and the, the whole, uh, is 5G going to bring airplanes crashing to the ground? All those sorts of questions. And then, Neela, I want to tag up quickly on the fourth uh, wireless carrier point. So, Gus, I want to start with you on Spectrum auctions. I think you will have some, some positive things uh, to say about uh, the success of Spectrum auctions and, and some of these themes. Over to you. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I guess I don't know uh, how broadly you want to uh, go in the discussion of spectrum and auctions, because uh, uh, the most interesting stuff I think right now uh, is on the auction front uh, and uh, USF bringing in uh, funding for um, fixed wireless. But uh, we, we can put that to the side um, for the time being. Um, uh, I, the, the spectrum auctions and the incentive auction, I, they, they've been game changers. They have uh, uh, fundamentally uh, uh, changed how we think about uh, spectrum and allocate the resource. The, uh, the challenge, I'm going to kind of jump ahead. Uh, the challenge I think we see most with the spectrum auctions uh, is exactly what uh, gets highlighted with the FAA dispute. And we saw this uh, a decade ago with light squared changing allocations where you have incumbents that have for a long time assumed that adjacent spectrum will be used in one way versus another, it creates a massive coordination problem. Um, and that sort of coordination problem uh, is really in many ways the, the bane of making this entire industry perform better. We see this as well in uh, uh, universal service and broadband funding where uh, we have the FCC and NTIA um, and RUS and uh, the uh, direct state funding uh, through a, a pandemic relief. Um, uh, a lack of coordination can lead to a, a lot of uh, uh, unfortunate duplication and inefficient allocation and at times efforts that are really uh, running uh, in conflict with each other. So Ernesto, one thing I want to invite you in on here, Gus, and I think you heard the Attorney General and the Chairwoman talk a little bit about um, the role of spectrum policy in facilitating new competitive entrants in the um, in the market for for internet service. Um, obviously, EFF has been a big proponent, and 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 you've been a big proponent of fiber as as the future, and of thinking about you know more more robust, perhaps faster networks that sort. Thing. What's your reaction to the this, the notion that spectrum policy um, is going to be be a really important way forward to give us facilities based competition? No, I, I think I mean I think that's right, and I think the um, you know Gus is I think is is alluding to the um, like the low hanging fruit or the easiest ways of, of, of freeing up capacity in the wireless space are are, are kind of gone uh, from my perspective. I think we are going to be dealing with more and more, you know, shared slash adjacent type approaches because the capacity uh, needs to increase in order to make use of, um, you know, use of the options out there. I, you know, I think wireless has a has a long future so long as it is connected to fiber uh, at the end of the day. But if there isn't uh, sufficient wireless allocation to to leverage the infrastructure on the ground, then it, then it's you know it's pretty um, pretty hollow. I, one one thing I would say. What's missing a bit from the from the auction standpoint is um, the importance of unlicensed or the importance of if you really want to bring really small entrants into this space, um, they have to have access to the infrastructure on the ground at, at a fairly reasonable means, but they also need uh, cheap, if not free access to the airwaves in a way to um, deliver uh, access. Otherwise, um, you know, then we're completely dependent on licensees who are the, you know, essentially the largest players who have the, the most money to be able to participate in these auctions in the first place. So, you know, I think there's been a shared commitment by the FCC um, uh, on, on a bipartisan basis about em the emphasis of the importance of unlicensed. But uh, if we already have challenges with managing different licensees because of, of, of many of the issues that, that Gus highlighted, um, I think it's even more so when we start talking about 
the need for additional unlicensed space, uh, particularly the uh, the um, you know the frequencies you would need to make use of um, high speed wireless. Neil, I want to pull you in here. Obviously, this hits a lot of the verges, sort of hot buttons, right? I, I, I feel like we've had an unusual amount of controversy around spectrum policy in, in the last year. Um, obviously, you mentioned the, the fourth wireless carrier. Um, I, I think Gus and Ernesto are having a little bit of a, a debate about what role wireless is likely um, to play. I'm thinking about your writing on Starlink, and then obviously the, the FA and FA FCC um, debacle over the last uh, several months has has sort of drawn a, a lot of attention. What do you think this all means for consumers, for people who use this stuff in, in, in practice? Uh, what do you think it means for innovation uh, and the layers up the stack from, uh, from, from wireless networks that, that depend on good policy choices being made here? Yeah. I, first, I want to say, on the, just on the sharing front, one of the things that you become a journalist is you you just get stuck with several stories for like your life. And like Microsoft has been chasing white space spectrum sharing to deploy broadband for 15 years and they like can't figure it out, right? And it's Microsoft, they really want this to happen. So I think there's, there's work to be done there and it is the future. It is just technically very hard. And I think that's just one of the, one of the things that sometimes policymakers forget is that technical implementation can often stymie your, your good intent. On the spectrum front, you know, with the FAA, um, we thought that was a big story. We were covering it. We deployed our resources against it. We had to create stakes for regular people to understand what was going on, right? And one part of the stakes was, well, AT&T and Verizon have been saying all these things to you about 5G for a long time, and none of them have come true for you, right? Like your phone is still using dynamic spectrum sharing with its 4G network if you're on AT&T and Verizon. Your speeds really haven't improved. But maybe you got a subsidy because they're desperate to turn off their 3G networks and all this other stuff. So the airline company is suddenly coming out and saying, we're canceling flights if they turn on these networks. Created this enormous set of stakes out of what appeared to be nowhere. And then we were kind of tasked with, one well, of this is a long process and there's this weird interagency miscommunication. And maybe the FAA doesn't have the resources to do it. Maybe they shouldn't even be doing it. It's the FCC's domain. And you quickly go from, am I going to get faster internet and safe planes to a bunch of policymakers forgot to talk to each other. And I think that is like the reality of a lot of these stories is that people, regular consumers, regular people are just trying to go about their lives. And they're paying a lot of money to these companies for goods and services for their phones and their, their cell service. And they see the policymakers is mostly like regions of failure instead of regions of, as I think the chairman brought up as we've all, but when they get it right, you create the opportunity for innovation. You create unlicensed spectrum for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth to flourish. And there's no credit for that. There's only credit for these misfires. And I think that's one of those, I think it's just a forever tension that we have in our coverage. But I think it's also, right, we, we just live in a time of, of low trust in government, I would say. And that is just going to keep escalating as these misfires happen, especially in spectrum. Because if you don't have internet access, you're real mad. And that that gets fired not at your handset maker, maybe not at your ISP, but often at the people in charge of those companies because they will point to them first. Jennifer, can I bring you in on this question of regions of failure, as Neil described it, on the the sort of difficulties that we're seeing in the re real fissures in the relationships between government agencies, the ability to nimbly set policy and resolve disputes when it comes to spectrum and, and reach these broadband deployment goals that, that we'll get to in a second. From from your perspective, obviously spending a lot of time in the in the legal trenches on, on these sort of things what's there to do there? What's, what's, what do you see as the root of the, of some of the dysfunction that, that Neil is describing, or, you know, conversely, if you, if, if you don't feel like there, that's, that's the right description, um, love to hear that too. It's interesting. Um, again, a theme from, from Gus and Ernesto and Neil's comments is uh, really about this idea, the importance of coordination between the agencies and in particular between NTIA and the FCC, but not only that, that, that when NTIA does that coordination with the FCC, that they really are the representative of the federal side in having those conversations. When I was at the FCC, we spent a lot of energy on light squared and 
um, you know, we went through all that and, um, you know, changing allocations, you know, dealing with the fact that we've sort of cleared the low hanging fruit, um, like Ernesto said, requires real efforts on both sides to um, really come to the table and have an honest and open dialogue about what's the realm of the possible um, and that the stakeholders behind them are um, going to abide by whatever agreements made. So, you know, this new MOU between the FCC and the NTIA, I think there's a lot of hope for that. Um, and just a, a, a more robust acknowledgement that when NTIA comes to the table, they come with that federal government um, so that that negotiation actually bears fruit, you know, for the benefit of all consumers. So Ernesto, I want to pivot over to broadband here. And I think when we, we talk about coordination, um, we've now got this massive effort of basically the FCC and, and NTIA um, allocating a, a big amount of money um, to be implemented on a pretty state and local level um, to spur broadband deployment. And obviously the, the notion uh, that the, the chairwoman raised is this is no longer optional, right? Right. This is we. I heard her draw a comparison um, to to the 1930s and electrification. Like, uh, but this is now we're we're now in in utility land. Um, what do you see um, as the as the role for this kind of coordination um, as as these broadband policies uh, start to get deployed um, in the states? What do you see as as promising avenues? What do you see as pitfalls? Yes, certainly, I think the. The pro let's start with the promising uh, before I get to the pitfall. The promising avenue is, um, I do think the combination of, of the state's investments of their own as combination with the congressional investment uh, really will make the digital divide a thing we talk about as a historical note in a number, a, a great number of places in this country. I mean, $45 billion is nothing to scoff at. Um, and it doesn't necessarily need to be the result that uh, every connection is fully subsidized by the government. There's actually a, lot, a number of creative ways, uh, creative models that can leverage those dollars to, to eventually enable universality you know, over the long run. Um, and you know, the pitfall is um, kind of twofold. One, um, you know, Congress wants the 50 states to kind of come up with their own plans. I, I do worry some states may not have the um, you know, the, the, the requisite research and, and feasibility studies and things in place to map out what their their 2030 year plan is here um and then the danger to that is um to borrow a page from rural electrification because i think it's exactly the way the game plan the right way to do this is engagement with local the local folks in the areas of need uh and the promotion of local public and private entities to to do the building uh i think the mistake would be uh going to the same handful of large national players who have been subsidized uh to the tunes of many many billions uh, to deliver the access we have now, which is vastly inferior to most other countries. And um, you know that that's driven by the fact that they're the way they look at networks, the way they look at investing in infrastructure is just not compatible with what the goals of Congress set out, which is uh, scalable networks, meeting evolving needs, capable of enabling uh, 5G and other advanced services. You know these are really long-term bets. These, these are bets in, in pushing fiber pretty far out there. Uh, and that's going to rely on, you know, entities who aren't looking at quarterly reporting and dividends and stockholders and how to make it all back quickly for a profit in, in a short window. Um, rural, you know, one of the interesting notes from the Department of Agricultural, Agriculture folks about uh, rural electrification is, you know, they put out 40-year debt obligations out there and no one defaulted. And I think the connection between electricity and broadband are, are, are very tight in the sense of, I, I think it would be unrealistic to think people won't need broadband 40 years from now uh, or people won't need a, a robust connection to the internet 40 years from now. I think we all are concluded it, it is with us forever uh, as a matter of electricity and water. And that provides stability for long-term financing, long-term planning in the sense of, you know, yeah, it's going to take us 40 years to pay this off. You build the right infrastructure, it's going to last longer than that. And it's still going to be used, uh, you know, for the decades that follows. But that's going to depend on a lot of smart planning on the states uh, to kind of recognize that. And, and the, you know, the pitfall is, you know, the big, a big company comes in and say, hey, you know, for a fraction of the cost, we'll get everyone connected. Just trust us. And uh, I, I think inevitably a few states may fall for that. 
So Gus, I want to bring you you in here. I think we got themes of rural connectivity and the particular challenges that come from that. And I think we've we've heard about the the costs of doing that, how to how to solve that that cost structure. Um, and, and Ernesto surfaces the idea of public private partnerships and the role of the government in in providing networks. Your reactions on on both or either of those fronts. Yeah, so uh, being cognizant of what the, the clock is telling me, uh, Little Hand says it's time to rock and roll. Um, the, there, there's a whole lot here. Um, uh, uh, I mean, what, one, of the, the weirdest, one of the weirdest things that I have seen in uh, recent years was the Senate uh, committee confirmation hearing with uh, uh, Alan Davidson for NTIA and Gigi Sohn for the FCC, where uh, the senators were uh, grilling Davidson about uh, how the NTIA would use uh, the uh, broadband deployment money with a commissioner uh, nominee for the FCC right, sitting right there. It, it was just, it, it, was, it was mind boggling and weird because isn't this what the FCC is supposed to be doing? Um, and it goes to this coordination challenge. Um, Ernesto's point is really uh, powerful. Um, one of the concerns that I have that I've been hearing from a lot of folks uh, at the state level is there is a vast difference between the states in their preparedness to put in bids for uh, this funding. You're, we're seeing vastly different uh, dollar amounts being prepared and network schematics and designs being built out. Um, and this is a national level event that we're supposed to be, uh, or infrastructure that we're supposed to uh, be funding. And that sort of disparity, we're recreating potentially the same inequalities that we currently have in the uh, infrastructure. Um, so that's a uh, coordination between the states. Now let's talk about coordination between the technologies um, with uh, uh, the Connect America Fund, uh, CAF2 in particular, we inadvertently or possibly advertently uh, embarked upon an incredibly massive experiment in fixed wireless funding. So much of that funding went to fixed wireless providers and they're only just starting to get into the build out stages, um, uh, the deployment stages uh, that that was funding. So we've got this massive experiment with uh, uh, tens of billions of dollars backing it going on at the same time that we've got uh, uh, the, the new broadband funding going on. And we don't know how well the um, uh, fixed wireless technologies really are going to work. And that was one of the most exciting things about uh, the AG and a chairwoman's uh, comments towards the end. They showed real excitement for wireless and its capabilities here. And let me tell you, uh, bringing uh, uh, Nile's uh, comments in earlier about ORAN, um, I work with uh, engineering faculty here at uh, Nebraska who are building out next generation wireless test beds. And the thing they are most excited about and want to get their hands on and play with is ORAN. Well, these are academic researchers working to develop and build out these technologies. And what's that going to mean five years from now, 10 years from now, and today, as we're already in the 5G context, talking about the importance of this technology. And we're doing so much trying to do it all at once, which we have to be doing, but that means with so little coordination. So I think we've heard O-Rand enough during this conversation for it to constitute an official vibe shift. I, I hope I'm using that correctly. Neela, I know you want to react to that, but I actually want to ask you to answer a slightly different question because we've got just a couple of minutes before we shift over to students. And I want to make sure to, to give Jennifer just a second to say something about robocalling. Um, Neela, we, we heard a lot about broadband nutrition labels and transparency um, as a and the possibility of AG enforcement for deception and all that kind of stuff. Um, I guess from your perspective, does that matter to consumers or is that is that sort of going to reveal some of the bigger problems that we're talking about today? And I guess a second frame on that question, do you think that focus today was a function of the bipartisanship that we are currently in? And is there any chance that might we might be hearing about a different topic uh, in terms of broadband oversight, maybe uh, something that, that rhymes with, with net neutrality in, in a few weeks uh, if, if GG Sun is confirmed? 
Yeah, we'll see. Um, you know, my, you know, my belief is that markets run on information, right? So if you, you can provide structured information to consumers, I think they will take it and use decisions. The problem in broadband, especially, is well, where are they going to go? Right. I mean, that that was a great question from one of the students. Like, you, it's great to subsidize the connections. It's great to tell people what the connections will do. If you test your broadband connection and it doesn't meet what's on the label, your recourse is the state AG. Like that's kind of what we're hearing here, right? It's not, you can bail and switch to a competitor that's telling you the truth. And I think that's where you get to net neutrality, right? In any competitive environment, you it would be, one of my theories about the broadband industry is once you start letting them throttle and shape traffic, they immediately get to a place where they're zero rating everything. And then you just have unlimited broadband. We've seen the wireless carriers do it. T-Mobile makes uh, Spotify free, then Verizon does it, then T-Mobile has to add something else. And by the end of it, you just have unlimited broadband again. If there's competition, you don't need the regulatory environment to do it. So I think there's, I'm excited for the labels. I'm excited. Like, I think that's great for consumers. I have some questions about how you were able to test some of the claims. You can test speeds, but can you really test traffic shaping? as a regular consumer. But the piece of the puzzle, if you want to create a market without the information, is where is the market? And that, I think, remains unsolved and will remain unsolved as long as we kind of have a 2 2 OCC. All right. In lieu of trying to resolve that question in the 10 minutes that we have left, we'll, we'll let net neutrality lie for a moment. Um, I, we're going to turn to student questions in just a second. Um, but before we do that, Jennifer wanted to hand over to you. Um, obviously, you've got deep expertise on the questions about robocalling, which we haven't gotten a lot of time to talk about today. Quick reactions on that front. What's happening with robocalling? What's next? I've gotten like 18 robocalls while we've been talking here. Um, when is that going to stop? What's what's next for robocalling? So, um, you know, being anti-robocall is a very easy position to take. Uh, robocalls are the scourge of society, right? We hear that all the time. Um, there's a lot of efforts in place at the FCC, at the FTC, at the state AG level to combat this issue. I do think that we're getting close to the point where we have to think about the law of diminishing returns. Um, you know, there's um, very uh, burdensome regulatory obligations with perhaps less benefit to consumers and less ways to get Blake, less robocalls at some point. Um, there's not a lot of nuance in that thinking right now. It's just robocalls are bad. And so if they're bad, there's really, every, we should do everything we can to stop it. There's gotta be a point at which that cost benefit analysis starts to shift. Um, and I, you know, we're not there yet, I don't think, but I hope that that becomes at least part of the conversation. That is a fantastic note on which to shift over um, to student questions. We normally call this the wiser rule, although it, this does not come with the force of law. This is more a function of social norms and architecture here. So uh, we'll, we'll shift to uh, just the student question rule and happy to bring in uh, Clement Asante, who's one of my uh, uh, clinic student attorneys. Clement, over to you. Hello, everyone. Hope you, all get, you guys are all doing well. Uh, thank you so much for, for a great conversation today. and. Um, you know, I don't, I, this is all new to me, uh, and I don't know really much about it. And so this conversation has been very inf um, informational for me as well. So, but I, I think maybe, um, and Lily, maybe you touched on this a little bit, is competition um, in this space. And I think, like, if you look at, you know, what we have here in Colorado, like, we only have Comcast and say, maybe CenturyLink, and, you know, consumers don't have the option to to choose what kind of internet provider that they that they want for themselves. And so I, I, I think should it be a conversation? I think is it time, especially if this this fourth broadband service that Dish Network has been, you know, putting out for, for the last almost decade now, uh, it never like comes around. Is there a time to really start having a conversation? Is it time to break up the Verizons and the Sprint and the T-Mobiles and um, um, and the AT&Ts to, to maybe create more competition or maybe allow some of the smaller folks, um, you know, give them more resources to, to compete in this market. Throw that open as a as a jump ball to the the panel. Um, sure. I, I I think sure. it might frame it as 
what's what's next for for competition policy and 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 i'm guessing the answers might here uh, here might range from uh absolutely nothing needed to uh drastic interventions uh required but but throw it up in his jump ball to the panel sure so I, uh, I can oh, oh, go ahead all right uh, yeah, how about I, we go ernesto and then gus and then and then neil thank you um you know i mean colorado is actually one one of many states are now kind of uh, digging into you know infrastructure not so the services and then I, and I say that in that um and i forget if it's in colorado springs or or there's a company called underline that's building what's essentially an open access fiber network and um this is pretty prevalent in europe uh and it's it's really i think key for the ntia uh to to look at as like the infrastructure question which is essentially you're building the wires they're open, they're open to all uses, all players. The, the provider of those wires is not a broadband provider. They don't sell broadband, they just sell capacity and access to the, the lines. And th that's a way to kind of rationalize a lot of the, the, the needs for capacity that, that exists in the wireless space and telehealth and, and everything else. And um, you know that's a private version of that happening now. Uh, I think the right policies can, can facilitate more of that happening in more places. There's a public version of that happening already in other states. In Utah, uh, you have one of the largest um, you know, municipal fiber networks being built by a, a joint effort of 13 uh, cities. They're, they're, they don't sell broadband, they just build the wires. And they allow uh, about a dozen private small businesses uh, selling you know, gigabit, multi-gigabit services. Uh, California is going to engage in the same thing for their rural access issue. Uh, the county governments have, have created a joint authority, essentially just build the wires, make it open for anyone to make use of and, and, and offer capacity. So I think um, that is a big piece of the solution of, of, you know, that kind of kills multiple birds with, with one stone, which is you need the capacity for the future. Uh, you need competition for choice. And um, you need infrastructure that's ready, ready to meet increasing demand that is, that is ever consistent, ever perpetual. And uh, I, I think the NTA can really facilitate this if we think about this much more of a how do we get infrastructure to everyone versus um, how do we subsidize a broadband carrier to deliver a broadband service. Us, I look forward to hearing your enthusiasm for what I think was labeled a European model. Go ahead. <laughs> so uh, uh, cognizant of the time, I will not talk for three hours about this, but uh, I, it's a great, really rich, challenging question. Um, so. Uh, uh, there's a lot of detail here. Uh, uh, I'll just give a couple of points. First, uh, breaking up networks rarely actually increases competition. The purpose of breaking it up networks might be to create more opportunity for new entrants to come into the market, but look at the breakup of AT&T in the uh, 1980s. We had a nationwide uh, a monopolist in long distance and local. We broke up uh, the competition in local into various regional monopoly local exchange carriers. Local exchange service was still a monopoly service. So you didn't increase the amount of local competition uh, uh, by breaking up uh, the uh, uh, AT&T local exchange service. Um, Really, in this area, one of the biggest challenges is figuring out what level of service you need. So to give a example uh, that we had here in Nebraska, uh, there was a wireless ISP uh, that was uh, a really small company working to deploy uh, over 100 megabit per second service in an area that already was uh, being served by a couple of ISPs that were providing between 25 megabit and 100 megabit service. And then some uh, funding, uh, federal funding came into the state early in the pandemic and shouldn't have been allocated to a company, but it was uh, so that that company could uh, overbuild with gigabit service. Well, that wireless ISP decided I can't compete with that and pulled all of its equipment and deployed it to another area. And uh, the uh, uh, other companies offering 25 megabit uh, per second service, I think they were on DSL, so they couldn't upgrade to get into the 100 megabit uh, class. So in effect, you went from having uh, three, four, five companies offering a range of uh, broadband services, including 100 megabit plus service, to one company that was promising to enter with gigabit per second service uh, sometime in the next couple of years. That's a big loss for competition, if you ask me. So it's complicated. Um, and as Ernesto uh, alludes to, figuring out the margins along which you want to uh, uh, have competition and figuring out 
where in the network, where in the infrastructure to uh, support that, whether it can be done privately uh, through private investment uh, or public investment. That's, I, that, that's the FCC being boring. That's policy analysis being boring. Make telecommunications boring again, man. I, I'm right there. All right. N- noting that we've got just a minute left on the clock here. Um, Jennifer, any, any quick reactions? And then I'll hand it over to Neelai on the, on the last word in the uh, European versus uh, uh, I, I'm the, the Nebraska model, let's, let's call it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer to Neelai for the last words on that topic. Neelay, over to you. The question is Europe versus Nebraska. I'm, I'm thinking <laughs> how Nebraska. Uh, how, here's how, many, how many Verge readers do you have in each place? Who are you? <laughs> yeah, I got to look at the stats. I got to. I got to play. I got to play the base. Um, uh, one, I would just. There's some really good conversation about wireless versus fiber. I don't think it's the consumers aren't picking fiber. I think they don't have access. And I, I'll just die on this hill that wired connections are better than wireless ones. And we just see a lot of action in wireless in the home, right? Wi-Fi routers and mesh networks and all that stuff. But everybody wants a gigabit connection to their house. And I think that comes from fiber. And I think that's the thing to figure out. The last thing I'll say, the last word, I really believe this sincerely with all of my heart. A workable antitrust policy for the United States would be making it illegal for AT&T to buy anything. And that would solve almost every problem. Well, on that uncontroversial note, um, I feel like we have we have solved it. Um, with many thanks to our panel guests, Jennifer, Neelay, and Ernesto. Um, Brad, over to you to close us out. Yeah, a quick final note. Um, once upon a time, I led the technology law and policy clinic uh, that Blake, uh, as I've told him, now leads much better than I ever did. Uh, this panel discussion, Blake, you did this so much better than I would have. Many thanks to the panelists. Uh, to all the participants and everybody for joining in today. A uh, great conversation in the chat as well. Look forward to moving all of your voices from the chat room to the hallways here at Colorado Law at Boulder soon. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. We'll see you soon.